Glad that you guys are here, and we've been going through a series called Follow Me. We are looking at the words and the life of Jesus, and hopefully, no, I believe, we are gaining knowledge of who God is, and is transforming us in the way that we live and we act and we do our life. Uh, we went through a couple of things already. Uh, last week, we talked about Jesus' baptism. And I love looking at Jesus' baptism. It was an amazing thing. It caused me to think and ask a lot of questions. Why did Jesus get baptized? When John the Baptist was one, he was doing a baptism unto repentance. And I said, well, Jesus is a perfect man. So how, you know, what was his need for baptism? And we see in his baptism, he was submitting himself fully to the Father. And the Father's voice spoke over him, this is my Son, who I am well pleased. And this week we're going to move into Matthew chapter 4, and we're going to look at Jesus going into the desert, being led by the Spirit to be tempted. And we're going to, I believe, grab some something to rejoice in. I said, I said this morning as I was reading this passage this week, I said, man, there's something in this passage that we can rejoice over, we can get excited about. So I'm hoping that that's how we end this gathering this morning. It's, it's going to be ended on a point of, yes, God, you're amazing. Praise you, Lord. You're so good. I'm thankful for you. That's how we're going to end. You ready for that? Yes. I, I, want to, I want to end the sermon on that note. Jesus, yes, you did it. Amazing. You did it for us. So this morning, let's pray as we go into the Word. God, you are good. You're perfect in everything. And, and Father, I'm so grateful for your love for us this morning, that you would send your Spirit to us, and that your Spirit would, uh, would enlighten the Scripture to us. So Holy Spirit, we invite you here. Uh, actually, I pray, that, I pray that you would pray that too, you guys. Pray that Holy Spirit, you would speak, and that our ears would be open to hear what you have to say to us this morning. Father, may there be a spirit of rejoicing inside of us as we look at Jesus' temptation. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. 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 So let's look here at Matthew chapter 4. We, uh, we finished the baptism uh, last week in Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. Jesus gets baptized. His father says, he's, I'm well pleased with them. And then in verse 1 of chapter 4 it says this, then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. I would be hungry. A side note. Yesterday we're digging dirt. And I told Kurt, I said, hey, I got some beef jerky for you guys. And Kurt mentioned, he goes, yeah, I know, you like some food. You, you always mention it. I said, yeah, I like some food. This is the challenge in Scripture. He was hungry. I said, I can identify with you, Jesus. All right, verse 3. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on a pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you. And on the other hand, they will bear you up, or on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him, Again it is written, You shall not put your Lord, your God, to test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to them, and said to him, All these I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan. I love that. You know that we have that same kind of authority? The devil is defeated. Amen. Amen. Yeah, right? The devil is defeated. We already had the victory, right? Jesus won the victory. So now, as we put our faith in Jesus, the, the, the enemy, he has no power. And so, just like Jesus just told Satan, like a, like a fly, like a mosquito, we've been swatting, swatting lately around here. I mean, we be gone. Yeah, that's a, I mean, we're going to have some rejoicing time here. Is it, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. 
Now, I am hoping, and my prayer is, that we would end today in a time of praise, just rejoicing in who Jesus is. I don't know about you guys, but as a pastor here at Chapel City Church, man, I'm hungry for more of God. Amen. I'm like, I'm, I'm hungry. Like, I know that there is greater in store for us as a church. I know that there is greater in store for us as followers of Jesus. Like, I'm, I'm, hung, I'm ready for it. You know, last, last uh, month, or this month, September month, we had an advisory board meeting. And every time we get together, we, we always end in prayer. And I loved our, our ending this last month. And, and Kevin, I'll call on him, and he prayed. And man, he was like, you know what? God is raising up a standard in the church. He's raising up a standard of who Jesus is, and, and we're going to follow after that. And man, I believe that's a prophetic word for us. It's a word from God that, man, he is, is moving us toward looking and acting more like him. And I don't know about you guys, but I'm ready for some victory in my life. Like, I'm ready for things that, that I used to deal with no longer to be something that I deal with anymore. I, I mean, I'm, I'm ready to tell Satan, be gone. Like, get off of me. Get off my family. Get off my job. I'm like, I'm ready to walk in that. I, I don't know, but are you guys ready for yes. I mean, That's where I'm going. Like, but when I'm talking about this series about Jesus, that's what I'm excited about. God... I want something deeper. I want something real. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 16, we read that after Jesus was baptized, the Holy Spirit came on him and descended on him, and the Father affirmed his Son. I love Jesus' baptism because as we challenged us last week, it was, it was Jesus submitting all of his life to God's rule and righteousness. And I challenged us last week because we kind of had a somber ending where we're like, wow, am I submitted? Did I leave everything? Did I die completely to the flesh? And do I live completely for you, God, just like Jesus did? He lived that perfect example. On Wednesday night, we gathered as a group in my home, and uh, we got to this point at the end of our conversation, and we talked, and the question that I left with, the question for prayer that we had was, what's an area in your life that you still have yet submitted your life to Jesus? And we all went around the room, and we have a neighbor friend now that's been joining us on Wednesday nights, and, and I really love her. She thinks a lot. Uh, she has some uh, a Catholic background, and, and as we're going around the room, though, sharing about uh, an area of our life that we haven't completely submitted to Jesus, she kept on correcting everybody. Like I, I mentioned, you know, that I I, I I deal with worry too much, and part of my part of the reason why I get so frustrated is because I'm worried about tomorrow, what tomorrow will bring, and so then I get frustrated in the moment, especially when things didn't go right this week or. Uh, Rachel was sharing, and each one shared. And she, a, after we shared, you know, what we want to be more like Jesus, she was like, oh, it's okay to allow that in your life a little bit. And, and eventually she, she speaks, and, and she goes, you guys are being really hard on yourself. Don't you leave room for, your, for you to be human? And we said, we said, oh, God, this amazing moment to share with her. No, Jesus lived in perfect submission. And, and we have an opportunity as believers to look more and more like Him. And so, man, if there's any area in our hearts and in our lives that don't look like Him, our desire is that, wow, God, would you change me? Would you empower me so that my life would look like you and that you would get glory, just like you got glory through the life of Jesus? And she's, she's still mulling that over in her mind uh, of this difference in our hearts that, no, we want to be holy because Jesus said, be holy as I am holy. Jesus' baptism was that, that was, was significant because he was submitting himself completely to the rule and the righteous ways of God. And the Father looked at it and said, I am well pleased in that. And right after this baptism in water, this Holy Spirit anointing, the, that, that submission was tested in the wilderness. It's significant that the father said, this is my son 
who I am well pleased. And I believe the same thing for us this morning, that we have put our faith in Jesus, we have rested our life on Him. Many of us are saying, yes, God, I am walking this path of full submission. It is significant for us also to hear that you are my sons and my daughters who I am well pleased. I am pleased in the in the position of your heart. The heart is submitted to me. You are following, you're running after me. Because in the middle of the trial and temptation, we cannot think that God is displeased with us. The trials and temptation, the trial, the temptation that Jesus was about to go through, it was not because of God's displeasure in who he was. It was actually in the pleasure of his submitted heart towards him, in which he went through these trials and tribulations. That's a key thing in our lives. When we go through, when we go through a tough situation, when we go through a trial, when we or dealing with overcoming sin, we're not there saying, "Oh God, you're displeased with me and you're punishing me and you're torturing me." No, God is pleased with us, and in so doing, the temptations are coming in for us to follow through with our heart submission to the Father. Pleased with you. Keep going. I'm pleased with you. When this trial comes by, I'm, I'm pleased with you. And then we walk out that submission heart when the trials come. God is not, if God did not send Jesus into wilderness to be tempted, He does not tempt us or try us because of His displeasure. Remember Job's story? It wasn't His displeasure in Job. No, He said, Yeah, test Him. I know that He will not bow. He will not forsake me. He will not turn away. Man. Rejoice in that. Rejoice in that. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. He was led to be exposed by Satan's testing of his mission. Jesus' Jesus's obedience to his submission here was a threshold in time in the time of Scripture. Without Jesus' perfect and full submission, our salvation would never have happened. Like, this is, this is a, a threshold. Jesus' uh, Jesus's obedience here hung in the balance, our salvation hung in the balance of Jesus' submission, Jesus' obedience to go God's way and His alone. None would have escaped without Jesus' obedience here at the beginning. Why? Because Jesus was the one who was perfect and without sin. He, he had no blemish. In order to be the lamb that John the Baptist said, here is the lamb of God, in order to be that perfect sacrifice, his temptations had to go, he had to go through his temptations with perfect obedience, with perfect submission to the Father. And, and Knowing that all of this hung in the balance, Jesus going in, about to be attempted, uh, he goes ahead and he fasts for 40 days. Uh, that was his preparation for his temptation. And I was thinking to myself um, yesterday, just shoveling, shoveling the dirt again, and knowing that, hey, I, I begin to be weak. And I, when I went to Ace Hardware, I picked up some beef jerky. Uh, just because I, I needed some nourishment. I can't imagine Jesus uh, getting ready to face one of his biggest temptations, one of his, his biggest fights, right, it, up to this point, right? And he goes, I want to fast. I want to weaken myself. I want to show my complete submission. I want to show my lack of confidence in self, right? That's what fasting is. We're dying to self as a demonstration of our dependence on God. I need you. So in preparation of his temptation, Jesus fasts. We shouldn't move too quickly from this example. Jesus began his walk out with God by denying himself nourishment as a demonstration of his dependence on God for all things. I don't know uh, in your life whether you have a regular time of fasting. But I want to encourage 
you guys. Encourage us as a church. You know, maybe as a church tradition, we do that at the beginning of a year. We fast and we uh, display our dependency on God. Man, I believe that as we fast, as we deny ourselves natural nourishment, no, it's a demonstration that we are depending on God for our spiritual nourishment, for our physical nourishment to sustain us. There's, there's something in our spirit that is strengthened when we depend fully on God in that way. And so I encourage you guys, whether it be you know, our traditional first of the year fast, but no, on a regular basis, say, no, I want to fast this day so that my soul is encouraged. As a demonstration that, no, God, I depend on you for all that I need. In this passage here, we see this amazing uh, dependency on God. There's a, there's a correlation that we're going to make because Jesus, as he responds to the temptations of the enemy, uh, he quotes from Deuteronomy. And in Deuteronomy, we see this amazing thing happening, this transition from wilderness into the promised land, and, and, and how in the wilderness, the, the, the people of Israel depended on God for, his, for nourishment. And in this new foreshadowing of Jesus, of the people of God entering into the promised land, entering into the newness of God through Jesus, there's a, again this fasting and this dependency on God. So I don't know about you, but I'm ready to dig a little bit more. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 8. And we're going to see here the beginning of how Jesus, uh, Jesus responds to these temptations correlates with this earlier passage of Scripture detailing the people of Israel going from wilderness into what was promised. Every time Jesus uh, is tempted, he quotes from Deuteronomy. First, he says, he uses the words, man shall not live by bread alone. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. He quotes Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 16, by saying, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Deuteronomy 6.13 is the last temptation and the rebuke was, You shall worship the Lord your God, and Him only shall you serve. The Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness, and Satan tempts Jesus in the wilderness. Jesus here quotes Deuteronomy, which is spoken by Moses to the people that are in the wilderness, getting ready to enter into the promised land. And it's really neat that Jesus' name here correlates with the name um, of Joshua here talking about this. Again, man, so many parts of Jesus' story is his prophetically proclaiming what is to come. Jesus here getting tempted in the wilderness speaks not just of Jesus overcoming his temptation, but of our deliverance. How do we... How do we overcome the end? How do we gain our deliverance? How do we go to the other side? Man, we submit fully to who God is and His declared righteousness so that we can be delivered into the promise. This is what Jesus did for us. Come on, I'm going to rejoice, and I hope you guys rejoice. With me. This is what Jesus did for us. Matthew chapter 4, verse 3 and four. This challenge from the enemy, if you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Let's look now, I said turn to Jude, Deuteronomy. So we're in Deuteronomy chapter 8. And we're going to start in verse 2. And you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God had led you for these 40 years in the wilderness. I'm actually, I'm going to read verse 1. I apologize. 
commandment. The whole commandment that I command you today shall be careful to do it, that you may live and multiply and go and possess the land that the Lord swore to give to your forefathers. So note in this moment, the Lord directed them towards the wilderness to go into the promised land, just as the Spirit of God prompted Jesus, led Jesus into this wilderness to be tempted. And you shall remember the way the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness. I don't think it's a coincidence that Jesus himself also was fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, another parallel in this. That he might humble you, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart. Jesus, again, testing Jesus in this wilderness was about testing this submission to the way of righteousness, which was just talked about in Matthew chapter 3 in his baptism. Again, testing what is in his heart. Testing to know what's in your heart. In verse, uh, continuing, whether you should, would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. What does this mean? Why, why is this important? God is preparing to deliver his people, Israel, into the promised land. And just as Israel is delivered into the promised land, we are being made prepared to enter into the promised land through Jesus. And this demonstration, why does he do this? Why did he lead them into temptation? Why did he allow the Israelites to go in, 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 into the wilderness so that they would be fed, not by their own means, not by the bread that they make of their own hand, but by his bread? Why is so that they may know that man does not live by bread alone, that it is not by their own power, it is not by their own ability, it is not by their own, and we say this a lot, not by their own status, what they've done or what they've accomplished, not who they are, in which these things come to pass, but it is by depending fully on God and His power and His Spirit, by depending on them, then they overcome. In our daily life today, just as Jesus said, hey, it's not by bread alone. It's not by what I'm able to do. No, it's by the words of God. It's by the provision of the Father. It's by what He does in me and through me that enables me to walk in right standing with Him. That brings me out. It's by living the life that we couldn't live. Jesus overcame the temptation of the enemy. Praise the Lord. And it, I think about this when I was thinking about, about this passage again this week. I was, I mean, just, I couldn't help but think, Jesus, you did what I couldn't do on my own. You, you were so dependent. You were so submitted. God, Jesus, you were so obedient. You understood beyond what I understand to say, no, only what the Father would do, only what the Father would provide by this, I will overcome the enemy. How did Jesus overcome? He identified the lie of the enemy and he kept his eyes fixed on the eternal glory rather than the temporary satisfaction. There's a decide 40 days. I'm hungry. There's a temporary satisfaction. There's an immediate satisfaction. Turn it into bread and you will have your satisfaction. And, and Jesus so beautifully does. He said, no, it, it is not for the temporary. It's not for the immediate. It's not for what's before me. It's not for what my hands can do. No, it has to be for the way and the will of the Father and the Father alone. He kept his eyes kept on that. Remember, Jesus' obedience in this moment, the salvation of the world, balanced on Jesus saying, yes, I submit fully to the Father in his way. How do we, as a people of God, follow in Jesus' footsteps? Jesus recognized John 8, 44. We're going to go through this at, at another at a later part of the series. But that the enemy, he only speaks lies. It says in uh, John 8, 44, he speaks native, his native language. 
for he is a liar and he is the father of lies. He recognized here as Satan had some truth in this. Oh, you can do this on your, you could make this rock and turn it into bread. And the temptation that comes our way as well, uh, you could do this. It, it, it could happen this way. There maybe is some permission for you to create this or to do this your own way. But you could go after your flesh and, and, and seek this way. You could do it. But Jesus identified the lie. No, it, he's trying to get me to depend on myself, to put myself on the throne. But no, I just submitted myself. I just submitted myself fully to the Father, and He was pleased with, pleased with this submission. And so now in this, He goes, no, I will trust in God, just as the Israels had to trust in God for their bread. It represents dying to self. Yes. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3, is where Jesus gets this message from verse 4. Man should not live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. God fed the people of Israel with manna. And nobody had known it before them. And he did that so that they might understand, so that they might understand that man does not live on their own ability. Man does not live on the bread that they make alone. Man lives on everything that comes from the mouth of God. Eternal life, our salvation, is not on our own ability. It's not on what we can do. It's not on the way that we can fail. No, it is on the eternal words of the Father that never fade away. They never go away. It's he has, right? The disciples said to Jesus, you're the only ones that have the words of eternal life. How do we overcome the enemy? It, the, the, Jesus shows his example. It's not by what he, who he was, it's not by what he did. No, it's only by the eternal words of the Father that my dependency is fully on him. His words are the words of eternal life. Yes. Cling to them. Know them. What does that, what is that, how does that challenge me as we're thinking about the challenges of the word of man, uh, the challenges of the life of Jesus? I, I must know his word. I must find this as a sacred food. I, might, I must find that this is my lifeline. His word. Memorize, I will repeat this a million times. Memorize it. Read it. Meditate on it so that it becomes a part of me. So that when the enemy of lies, the one that speaks, depend on yourself, do your own thing, try this out, forget about scripture, forget about God and his provision, uh, depend on yourself, find your own way. When he says he's saying the word of God is, is so fresh and alive and in me that I combat it with the words of eternal life, the words that lead towards obedience. The words that lead towards victory. How do we become a church that is victorious over the enemy and his temptation? We know his words, we cling to his words, we treasure his words, we make his word the most significant part of our lives. So that when the enemy comes with his lies, we can identify them immediately. And we can cling to Jesus' way of submission only to the Father. I don't know about you this morning, but every time I look at this temptation of Jesus, I say, thank you, Jesus. <coughs> thank you, Jesus. It's not like, hey, we're going to end in a time of rejoicing. We rejoice in this. Jesus, you did it. You did what I couldn't do. It was amazing that we learn in Romans that he, the, the same power that Christ had is now in us, and, and we are victorious. We are overcomers, right, as well. So, so Jesus, I don't just get left with, oh, Jesus, you did it. Praise you, Jesus, you did it for me. But well, how praise you, Jesus. Now I have the template. Now I have the way. Now I have the power to do the same. Man, I don't know. 
We are victorious, guys, right? Like, we no longer have to be bound by the things that bound us. The enemy is defeated. I love the way that the scripture writes it at the very end when Jesus talks to, talks to Satan in verse 10. Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan. We have this same authority, but it's not on our own doing. Just as the manna from heaven was provided, not on the Israelites' right behavior, not on the Israelites' uh, you know, plan, uh, not by the Israelites' doing, no, it was from God Himself. Now we have that same victory and ability, a reminder this morning, we overcome not by our own, but by God's doing. Jesus' life and the way that he lived and the sacrifice that he has was an example to us. We couldn't do it alone. We rejoice in that. But it also means now we can't do it alone, but we can because Christ did. And he does it for us. He does it for us. Rejoice. You no longer have to stay where you are. And on Wednesday night, it was kind of like, it was kind of like this whole hum thing. She, uh, our, our good friend, you know, she said, hey, you know, you know, leave room for yourself. Leave room for your humanity. And I said, well, no, I don't have to stay. We don't have to stay this way. The beautiful thing about the gospel, we don't have to stay with where we are. Yes. No, we are victorious because Christ overcame the temptation. And his obedience in this moment was a threshold for us to live in that same land of deliverance. The Israelites were going towards the promised land. They were going towards a land that was flowing with milk and honey, that had fruit that was abundant, that, that was an amazing place for them to, to live and to dwell. And, and it was just a beautiful, beautiful place, a, a totally opposite of where they found themselves in prison and shackles in Egypt, right? If we know that if we follow the whole story. And so this moment of declaration that they depended on God for the manna, this moment that Moses is speaking is the same thing that Jesus repeats here because it's a metaphor of where we are as his people. Yes. And if we depend on God fully as Jesus depended on God for every movement, he only did what the Father, there is a deliverance, there is a promised land for us to take part in, for us to live in, for us to enter in. <coughs> See, I don't know where you are this morning, but uh, my prayer has been that you would be encouraged that there is a promised land that has been delivered for us because of Jesus' obedience. And so now, just like the Israelites didn't have to work for the manna, we don't have to work for the deliverance. We need to ask of it and say, Jesus, you lived a life of obedience. I could have lived. Jesus, do in me. Do for me. This deliverance, this victory, that I can walk in the promised land. I can walk in a deliverance. This morning, I want to invite you. I don't know when I invite you to bow our head. Let's stand this morning. We have we need to rejoice in Jesus' obedient submission. Can we just take a moment? I want to take a moment now and do that. I'll oh, have some time of praying at the end. But let's just take a moment. Thank you. Jesus for his obedience. Man, it was the it was a threshold moment. It was his, our salvation depended on it, and Jesus demonstrated. And I want to be fully submitted to the Father, even in the face of temptation. Father, we Jesus, we just thank you. We rejoice. We rejoice in the fact, Jesus, that you lived the life we could have lived. We celebrate you, Jesus, the perfection of the holiness, the submission to the Father. Wow, Jesus, we exalt you as high and above, Lord, all things. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you that you lived a life 
that we could live. Thank you that you lived in perfect submission. Thank you that you saw past the words of the enemy. You saw past the lie and you spoke truth. You clung to it. You cling to it. You, you held it in such high regard. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We rejoice in you. Root choice. Father, this morning, each one of us, we stand here in awe of you, Jesus, and we're reminded, and I pray, I pray that we are reminded of the strength that we have in you, the victory that we have in you, Jesus. Jesus, you purchased for us victory. You purchased for us the promised land. You purchased for us deliverance. Father, there's such a, such a parallel to this Deuteronomy chapter that we cannot deny that you're speaking to us this morning that there is deliverance in Jesus. There's deliverance in obedience. And so, Father, this morning, I declare for each one, Father Lord, a season of deliverance from that which bounds us and that yes. which holds us. Jesus, you, by your Spirit, empower us to be overcomers. The things of this world, the things of our flesh, they don't have to bound us any longer. They don't have to hold us down any longer. But no, Jesus, just, just as the Father provided manna from heaven, Jesus, you provide deliverance by your doing, by the Lord, not by the own works of our hands. So, Father, by your Spirit, I pray, God, deliverance for my brothers and my sisters, God, that we would walk in the victory, in the life that you died to give us. God, I pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. 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 If you're here this morning and you're saying, yeah, Andrew, I would love to pray with you that the deliverance that Jesus died to give me lived that I couldn't live, that I would experience that. And if you want that, and I'm like, if you want to tell Satan, be gone, then it's over. And that's the kind of that's the kind of prayer we're going to have right now. We're going to have prayer for God, deliverance to come through. We're going to tell Satan, be gone. You have no place any longer. I'm going to walk in the deliverance in the promised land that, that God has for me. So if that's you this morning, I just want to invite you to come and pray. With me, I want to be down here, uh, and maybe Linda, you could also pray with people this morning, and we're just going to believe that uh, we're going to tell the enemy, be gone, and we're going to walk in the same yes. victory that Jesus walked in. Can yeah. we this time? Yeah. Let's pray.